Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. You will hear adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia and the Paranormal with Jason, just to name a few. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. Oh, and you just might want to be prepared for being taken away from today. Another five minute mystery. This 5-Minute Mystery is being brought to you by fire. Fire is a funny thing, and while we can't live without it, it certainly should be avoided. I know this from personal experience. Now, here is our story. This has been your noonday program of news. The weather for this afternoon is cloudy and overcast, with probably showers this evening. Why do you bother with that radio writing? There's never anything new. What else is there to do around a firehouse, Eden? Sleep and go to fires. We'll be going to enough fires, all right, if they don't catch that arsonist who's been trying to burn up the whole city. Yeah, I'd like to get my hands on that devil. Maybe we will, Edens. Maybe we will. Holy smoke, here we go again. Watch that baby burn. Looks like the end of the world, doesn't it? They don't get their bloodhounds after that fire bug. It soon will be. Hey, who's that guy the chief's dragging along here? I don't know, but he's really got a grip on his arm. Maybe it's the fire bug. Hey, chief, who's the man you're holding? The rat who's been setting all these fires. Where are you taking him? Down to the station. Put out this place and hurry along. You hear that, Wrighton? Pour on the water. I want to see a fire bug get singed. You still deny that you set that fire? Let me call my lawyer. You can't question me this way. It's illegal. Let me go to work on him, Chief. That won't be necessary, Edens. I'm sure this prolific arsonist will come clean in just a few minutes. You got no proof? You were seen running out of the burning building just as the engines pulled up. How did the fire start? Listen, pal, I'll tell you I don't know. Now will you let me go? Why did you wait till the fire had gained so much headway before you finally ran out? I just woke up and I heard your sirens drawing near the building. Listen, my friend. We're out to break this cycle of arson that's been slowly destroying the city. You're in for some pretty rough weather ahead, unless you come clean and tell me how that fire started. The sooner you give me the truth, the easier it'll go with you. All right, Chief, I'll play ball with you. The whole fire was an accident. What? Yeah, I swear it was. I really went in there to get some sleep. And when I woke up, I lit a cigarette. That was my big mistake. The building was so old, it was almost falling apart, and there were cobwebs hanging all over the place. While I was shaking out the flame of the match, it hit some of the cobwebs hanging from the low beams, and that was it. Webs caught fire and spread to the roof, and the dry wood began to burn in a flash. What are we doing now, Chief? Take him to the police and book him on a charge of arson. His story shows that he deliberately set that fire. What lie in the firebug story did the Chief detect? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... Wait just a minute. How did he know? Well, actually, I have a pretty good idea, and it all has to do with the nature of fire. Specifically, what it can burn and what it can't. Think about it. Heat can melt certain things, like gold or wax, but will it always burn? And now, back to our story. What are you talking about, Chief? I told you it was an accident. If it was, you would have told a different story. You see, there was one very important flaw in your story that condemned it as a lie. Prove it. You said that the cobwebs caught fire and spread to the roof. Well, I'm afraid that isn't quite accurate. Unfortunately for you, cobwebs don't flame. All right, boys, take him away. Our firebug needs cooling off. See, spider webs will not burn. They will melt away, but they won't catch fire. Certainly not enough to cause a building to burn down. You would think our arsonist would know this. This 5-Minute Mystery was brought to you by Fire. 
which should be used safely. Is that you say? I have to say that we have quite a show for you today. We have an email from Mark, a kid named Zero, and a collection of ghost stories sent in by you that all have the common thread of fire. Did you say fire? Well, kind of. It's more of a phenomenon than anything else. We close the show with a classic from the golden age of radio called Strange New World that is reminiscent of a story written by Jules Verne in 1875 called The Mysterious Island. The difference is it has a modern twist and takes place on the Bikini Islands. I think you're going to enjoy this one. I should hope so. Uh, yeah. First up this week is an email from Mark Blank, who writes us from Chicago, Illinois. Hello, Ron. I've been wanting to ask you a question for a while now. I first started listening to your show with episode number 400. I heard an interview that you did on a UK radio station I listened to and thought that I would give you a try. I'm glad I did. My question is about your content. Your show must be time consuming to do each week. I do a fair amount of audio edits myself and to get the kind of quality you have takes dedication. How do you do it, Mark? Well, Mark, I use a system that makes the work less time consuming. I created a series of audio templates that allow me to plug in new material each week. For example, the What's That You Say segment is recorded, the audio is cleaned up, and then simply pasted in. This saves me from reinventing the wheel each week. My only concern is I worry about the content becoming stale. So to combat that, I'm always thinking of new things to try. Take last week's podcast, Past, Present, and Future. Also, if you noticed this week, the opening was a bit different. I'm testing out a set intro that does not have to be updated each week. Hope you guys like that. I have found that most podcasters use a set intro and outro to save time. So let's see how it works. Thank you for your question, Mark. On the podcast last week, Jason Dowd was here and he set up a challenge for us all. A while back on the Horror Express, I'll have the link in the show notes for you. We talked about David Larson's marionette. Jason conducted a full investigation and then forgot about it. However, quite recently, the doll came up missing and he wants us to guess as to what may have happened to it. So please get your guess to ronsamazingstories at gmail.com or simply use the contact tab on the main page. All ideas are welcome, no matter how strange. Jason and I will read your guess on the air, and then Jason will tell us what really happened. So, get your thoughts in today. That's all I have this time. Now, here is a word from Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? Zero G by Dan Wells, which is another Audible original. It is an incredible story. It's about one kid nicknamed Zero versus an entire band of space pirates. It begins simple enough. Zero is just one of 20,000 people aboard a spaceship bound for a new planet set to be colonized. Here is a clip of what you can expect to hear. It's hard to choose a favorite thing about outer space. But if Zero Huang had to pick just one, it would be gravity. 
or more specifically, the complete lack of gravity. Planets were pretty cool, but in space, he could fly. Which was why, waiting in the giant line to board the Pathfinder, he was sitting on the ceiling. You're supposed to hold the railing. Zero's mom, of course, was holding the railing tightly. She always followed the rules. In fact, looking up and down the long straight hallway on Abasi Station, almost all of the passengers were holding onto the railing, grasping it tightly to keep from floating away. The only ones who weren't were kids like Zero, though at 12 years old he was probably the oldest of the goof-offs. All of them were wearing the one-piece coveralls that marked them as Pathfinder passengers. Just hold the stupid railing, Zero. Yan was Zero's middle brother, almost 15 years old, and always acted like he was in charge. Don't call him Zero. Their father had his nose deep in a book. Not a tablet book like a normal person reads, but a real, old, dead tree book like they used to read in the olden days. He wasn't holding the railing either. Instead, he had his foot hooked under a bar that ran along the floor. That's how the real space travelers did it, he'd told them. Keep your foot under the bar and you can stay in one place and use both your hands. Just like on Earth. Zero's father was kind of an expert in that stuff. After all, he was one of the engineers who'd built the Pathfinder. Yao Zhu Huang had spent most of the last five years on a bossy station, overseeing the construction. Zero still thought he was probably wrong about the floor bars, though. Because why would a real space traveler want to stick to the floor like that? You could literally fly up here. Railings were for losers. Zero's parents hated it when his brothers called him Zero. But Zero didn't mind it. Anything was better than his real name. Sushu. Because then his brothers would call him... You mean Tushu? Yep. That's what they'd call him. It wasn't even an insult. Zero didn't know why they called him that. But he still hated it. Which, he supposed, was probably why they called him that. <laughs> Come on down, Tushu. <laughs> Put those two shoes on the floor. My name is Zero. Park was Zero's oldest brother, already 16, which was apparently old enough that he considered his brothers to be completely beneath his notice. Most of the time, at least. If he was teasing Zero now, that probably meant he was bored. Better bored than cranky, Zero decided. Park had a girlfriend, but her family wasn't part of the Pathfinder mission. He could text her for a few more hours. Abasi Station had great reception. But then they'd board the ship, settle in, take off, and Park would never see her again. They'd never see anyone again, really. Unless that person were on the Pathfinder, too. Or maybe the torchbearer. After more than a century of searching, the human race had finally found two habitable planets, called Genji and Kaguya, orbiting a star called Murasaki, and they'd built two colony ships to go out and settle them. The torchbearer mission had left last month, and last week it had cleared the solar system and boosted the Medina star drive, accelerating to almost one-fifth of light speed. In about a month, Pathfinder would clear the solar system and do the same. But even at that speed, the journey would take a very long time. Murasaki was more than 20 light years away. The Pathfinder, and everyone on it, would be traveling for 105 years. The journey will take over a century to complete, but luckily everyone is in stasis. Everyone that is but zero. His pod has malfunctioned, waking him up 100 years too early. At first, Zero is excited to be roaming the ship alone, but that quickly turns into a heart-stopping interstellar adventure when a family of space pirates show up. Their goal? Well, to hijack the ship and take the colonizers hostage. With everyone he knows fast asleep, it's up to Zero to think fast and find a way to stop them all by himself. Now, you can have Zero-G today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. 
they are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you too can have Zero G's adventure all to yourself. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. Again, this week we have a theme. Fire plays a role in every story sent in by you guys, the listeners. Not a simple flame or an odd occurrence around the fireplace. These are about ghost flames, or sometimes called will-o'-the-wisp, spook lights, or even corpse candles. The way ghost flames are reported depends upon the location and period where the sighting took place. For example, R.C. McLaughlin wrote about such ghost lights in the Scottish Highlands in 1897, where lights were seen prior to deaths occurring at those locations. In these stories, the lights were referred to as corpse candles. In 1902, newspapers reported a ghost flame appearing over a mountain where a woman's body was earlier found in a barrel. Towns across the world where this phenomenon take place often attribute the flames to fairies, angels, or even demons. Who can say what they are? But here are three stories about them. Our first story comes from the great state of Texas and was sent in by returning listener Maddie Ross. Maddie calls her story Ghost Hand. Hello, Ron. I heard you asking for ghost stories, and here's mine. So about two years ago, my friend was living with his parents in an old house. They are devout Christians and had the house blessed multiple times due to other paranormal stuff that had happened there. They wouldn't talk about it other than to say that the house has issues. Anyways, after living in this house for about a year, my friend's little sister started waking up screaming at night. They assumed it was just nightmares, but she refused to talk about it. One night, everything came to a head. She had gone to bed early, and the rest of the family was heading that way when she woke up and started screaming herself hoarse. Her dad came into the room, and she was lying on the floor under her bed, screaming and shaking. Her dad pulled her out and asked what happened. Apparently, she had seen a flame arm come out of the floor and pull a book, out of the bookcase. Her dad asked her which book it was, and she told him. He walked over to the bookcase, and that exact book was on the floor, and the cover was burned. The pattern was in the shape of a hand. Long story short, they did some research, and found out that just over 20 years ago, someone had been murdered in that exact same spot where the bookcase was. They blessed the house again, had a psychic come, but have since moved away because it didn't seem to do a thing. That house stands empty to this day. Maddie Ross, Texas A flame arm. Crazy. These types of stories really make me shiver. Was it menacing? Were the other events in the house malevolent? I guess we'll never know. I think the fact that they moved says volumes, and I don't blame them a bit. Thank you for the story, Maddie. Our next story also comes from Texas and was sent in by Seth Wood. Seth has titled this story, The Big Thicket Ghost Light. I did a little research on this one, and I want to share what I found with you before we read Seth's story. The Big Thicket Light, also known as the Saratoga Light, appears to travelers along Old Bragg Road in Hardin County, Texas. 
The road was originally a rail bed for a train that traveled from Bragg Station to Saratoga from 1901 through 1934. The lights were reported almost as soon as people started traveling through the area, and news reports about the lights started to increase in the 1960s. National Geographic even published an article on the ghost flame in October of 1974 with an actual photo of the light. I'll have that for you in the show notes. Now, here is Seth's story. Hello, Ron. Thank you for your podcast. My family and I listen together each week and chat about the stories you share. It's something I personally look forward to each week. I know that you like ghost stories, and I have one that happened to me. We live near a pretty famous haunted site. It's called the Big Thicket Ghost Light, and even has its very own site marker that has been there since the 1960s. Back in 1995, my brother, my newly wed wife, and a friend of ours climbed into a Volkswagen Beetle and headed to Bragg Road. We wanted to find out if all the hoopla surrounding the ghost was real and to see if there was any truth to the stories. When we got there, it was dusk, so we could still see the dirt road and the tall overhanging trees. I saw a small yellow light that seemed to be about a half a mile or more away. The more we stared at it, the brighter and closer it became. Then suddenly, the color changed to amber and the light started moving from side to side. I got out of the car along with my brother and suddenly, It turned white, and it was about the diameter of a bowling ball. It stopped in front of our car some 25 yards away, and then shot up towards the sky. We looked at each other in stunned silence. This was not what we had read about. But the night wasn't over yet. We again looked down the road, and the amber light was back, waving back and forth. This time, it didn't get any closer. I went to the car to get my camera, and as I did, I felt a hard shove. Thinking my friend was messing around, I told him to knock it off. I heard his voice from a few feet away. I didn't shove you. Turns out, I was alone. Then, my wife screamed. I turned to her, and she was pointing towards the woods. A flame was floating towards us very slowly. Not needing any more encouragement, we all jumped back in the bug, and we bugged out of there. Seth Wood, Beaumont, Texas. Good choice, Seth. I probably would have done the same thing, but probably a lot sooner. I found this little ditty on the internet. Town urges timber cutters to not cut timber on Haunted Road, Houston, AP. The East Texas town of Saratoga is once again up in arms over salesmen who want to cut and sell the timber from a haunted ghost road but the residents want nothing to do with spoiling the spirit world that they claim that haunts the eight-mile sandy path that seems more like a tunnel with its thick canopy of trees and other foliage. For the fifth time in the last 30 years, Hardin County commissioners have moved to sell the timber, and for the fifth time, residents have objected to removing any of the roadside timber that provides the spooky ambience. Hmm. How about that? Thank you for your story, Seth. Our last Ghost Light special comes from Colorado, and it was sent in by Danielle Harvey. Danielle calls her story, This light I can't explain. I am a pathological paranormal nut. The first time I heard about you was on Jim Harold's campfire, and in fact, we both appeared on the same show never written in before, but became a fan as soon as I listened to you for the first time. I decided to retell you the story that I told Jim that night on his podcast. I was heading home from a school event. The year was 1984, and I was driving alone along a stretch of road heading home. Just then, a flame of light appeared before me. I slammed on the brakes and came to a stop just inches from the apparition. It had no shape that I could see, and it looked like, just what I said, an amber flame just floating across the road. It paid no attention to me and went on its merry way. I sat there for a minute after it was gone and tried to make sense of it all. 
All I could do was remember something my grandmother once told me, and she said that sometimes the dead just have to be noticed to move on. I never saw it again. The next day I was reading the newspaper about a young girl that had been struck and killed by a horse trader who had fallen asleep at the wheel. Where do you think the accident took place? If you said the same area that I encountered the flame, you would be right. Maybe Grandma was right after all. Danielle Harvey, Grand Junction, Colorado. Another ghost flame and another story. You know, I love it when I can get three stories that line up so well. To Danny, I say, thank you for sharing this, and I'm sorry it took so long to get it on the show. Also, I think it's amazing that we sort of met on Jim's Campfire Podcast. Our featured saga is nothing short of amazing. When I search for stories for the show, there are times when I find one that thrills me a little and chills me a little. One thing I can always count on is that the radio series Mysterious Traveler does it every time. Imagine yourself as a pilot forced to ditch your plane in post-World War II tropical waters. Oh, not just anywhere, but a few miles off the coast of the Bikini Islands. Do you know that place? Have you heard of it? Well, you will after our story. It is titled Strange New World and first aired on The Mysterious Traveler, February 12, 1952. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and starring two of radio's foremost actors, Clifford Carpenter and Lawson Zerbe, in Strange New World. This is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as we follow two young flyers on a routine flight which suddenly deviated from normal and brought them to a strange new world. Our story begins aboard His Majesty's ship, the submarine Valiant, somewhere in the vast Pacific. Captain Farnsworth, commander of the Valiant, makes his way along the narrow passageway of the submarine to the sick bay and uh, steps into the small cabin. No. No, Pete, no. You're wrong. Wing flaps are down. Well, we're going to hit. What? How is he, Higgins? Uh, not too good, sir. Lord knows how many days it was adrift on that life raft. Did you find any identification on him? Oh, yes, sir. His dog tags. Here they are, sir. Thank you. Daniel Walker. Lieutenant of the United States Air Force. Of course, I knew from his lingo, sir. He was an American. That's quite so, quite so. Well, Higgins, you'll have to do what you can for him until we reach a ship with the doctor. Ah, yes, sir. Pete, where, where am I? I think he's coming out of it, Captain. Yes. Who, who are you? Lie quietly, Lieutenant. I'm Captain Farnsworth, His Majesty's Navy. You're aboard the submarine Valiant. We picked you up an hour ago. Pete, the island. I take it you were forced down while flying, Lieutenant. And what happened? happened? Yes. Pete Mendez and myself were flying a C-47 from Honolulu to Japan. There were only the two of us. Pete was the pilot, 
I was holding down co-pilot. We were attached to air transport and had aboard a cargo of medical supplies. We were six hours out of Honolulu, and I'd taken over the controls. Pete was relaxing in his seat, chewing on a chocolate bar. Hey, where's the newspaper we picked up in Honolulu, Junior? Right behind you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard it. Now, what's the good news? They exploded another atomic bomb at Los Alamos. Oh, yeah? Anything else of interest? Isn't that enough? Hey, what are you doing? I haven't seen that paper yet. I'm sorry. What are you getting so worked up about? What's one atomic explosion, more or less? Oh, you're just a kid, wet behind the ears. <laughs> okay, Pop, relax. I was there when the first one was used. Where? Hiroshima. Oh. Well, I didn't know that. There's a lot you don't know, Junior. Yeah, well, give me a chance, will you? You weren't on the plane that, uh... Actually dropped it, were you? No. I was piloting one of the escorts. It must have been quite a sight. Yeah. I hope I never live to see another one. Yeah. Hey, look at those clouds ahead. We may be in for a rough trip, Junior. Better let me take over. Rate of speed, 125 miles an hour. Yeah. This typhoon we're bucking must be hitting peaks of 150 an hour. We're right in the center of it. Wide open? Wide open. How about turning back? We can. For an hour past point of return. We've been taking this beating for hours. When's it going to let up? That's hard to say. The worst typhoon I've ever seen. Look at the compass, completely haywire. Any idea where we are? No, not anymore. How long do you think we can take this? What I'm worried about is the gas. We're running low. Yeah, how much we got left? Two hours. Two and a half at the most. Well, that means we're going to have to set down on the drink. Yeah. Our one hope is that this lets up and we find a ship to sit down there. You better prepare a life raft. Stock it with plenty of water and rations. Okay. I'll take care of it right away. Well, looks as though we've come through it. Yeah. Well, that was one to tell your grandchildren about. There go the engines. Okay, Junior, get back to the raft. Be ready to launch it when we hit. All right, Pete. Put it down nice and easy. Those are my intentions, Junior. What's the altitude? 1,600. 14. Water rock? Well, not too bad. 800. 600. 4. Wing flaps are down. Get ready with the hatch, Junior. Right. We're down to 100. Hang on. You okay, Dad? Yeah. How are you going fast? Here, give me a hand with the raft. Right. There sure is a lot of water out there. I climb in, will you? Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's... Uh. Yeah. Okay, let's shove off. Uh. So far, so good. We shoved off into a sea that was running plenty high. In a few minutes, the waves carried us off and the sinking plane was lost to sight. Pete rigged up a distress flag so we could be more easily spotted. And then we settled back to wait. For two nights and one day, we drifted in a fast-running sea with a heavy overcast. There wasn't a sign of a plane or ship. 
By the dawn of the second day, the overcast lifted and the sea became calmer. It was around noontime that Pete spotted the island. We rigged up a small sail and began paddling for it. You recognize the island, Pete? Have you any idea which one it is? No. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Looks fairly big. Yeah. Hey, look. The channel through the reef and into the lagoon is directly ahead. The tide is helping to carry us in. Good. So we want to end up on those reefs. Brother, we're really moving. Yeah, another minute or two and we'll hit the beach. You think there might be some natives on the island? There should be. It certainly looks big enough. I don't see any huts or anything. No. Hold on, we're going to hit the beach. Yeah. Well, that does it. Hop out and give me a hand. Let's drag it out of the water. Yeah. Right. Oh, it sure feels good to be able to walk. All right, pull. Okay. That's it. A little more. Okay. There. Oh. Hey, look at those coconuts. Yeah. Let's begin looking the island over, Junior. See if we can find any natives. Pete took some food and a canteen of water from the raft, and we started walking along the beach, now and then cutting inland to look for water. It took us six hours to walk around the island, and the sun was just setting as we got back to the life raft. Sit down, Junior. Take a load off your feet. I don't mind if I do. Cigarette? Yeah, nice. Well, we found fresh water. Signs that natives had once lived here, but they sure aren't here anymore. No. That's strange, considering the island is three miles wide, almost two miles long. I've seen natives living on islands one half the size. I wonder why they left. Got any ideas? No. Well, it's just you and me. Sit tight and lead the right Riley. So we're picked up. Yeah. And the first thing we'll do in the morning is run up a distress signal on one of the palm trees. We'll also get brush together for a fire. Check. What do you say we have supper and turn in? It's been a long day. Okay, Judith. Sounds like a good idea. Wake up. Huh? Huh? Oh, oh, what time is it? 2 a.m. 2 a.m.? What are you waking me for? Go to sleep. Pete, I, I heard something moving around in, in, in the brush inland. Oh, probably wild pigs. Island's full of them. Go to sleep. It, it, made, it made too much noise for a pig. Oh, holy smoke, Junior. It certainly wasn't an elephant. Well, maybe not, but... Do you hear that? Yeah. I heard. Does that sound like a pig in the brush? Ah, maybe there's a herd of them. Who's kidding who? Okay. Okay, where do I get my 45? All right, come on. Let's have a look. And step lightly. Sounds as if it's over that way. Yeah. And listen to that. It almost does sound like an elephant. Look, the moon's coming out behind those clouds. That's a break. Yeah, and we're getting closer. Now we better take it easy. The sound of it, that 45 of yours isn't going to do much good. Well, I got the feeling I'm, I'm dreaming all this. I've been on dozens of tropical islands like this one. Biggest thing you'll find on any of them are wild pigs. That's no wild pig, brother. Yeah. That's why this seems like a dream. What the devil could it be? You see anything yet? No. Look out for those palm leaves, they're sharp. Yeah, okay. Listen to that. Good Lord. Look. It was like a nightmare. A nightmare you can't escape from, try as you will. 
there, 50 yards away in a clearing in the underbrush, was a monster. A monster that baffled the eye and brain for a moment, then began to come into focus and take shape. What I saw before me was a water crab, only a hundred times larger than the crabs that scurried along the beach. The monster crab in the clearing stood fully 20 feet high, with legs the thickness of palm tree trunks. The antenna on its frightening head was yards long, and its eyes were unbearably evil, even from a distance. Its 12 legs carried it slowly but lightly through the underbrush. Don't move, Dan. We don't want to attract his attention. Pete. What is it? I don't know. It's a crab of some sort. Only a hundred times larger than any I've ever seen. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Oh, the size of it. It must be at least 18 feet high. And those claws. You could park a car under its belly. I can't believe it. Yeah. Do you think there may be others like it around? I don't know. I hope not. Look, it's moving toward the beach. Yeah, I see it. Yet I still can't believe it. Maybe it's an hallucination. Both of us having the same hallucination, hardly. Well, how do you account for it? I can't. It's on the beach going into the water. Yeah. There it goes. God. Look. We better stay here, Junior. And just sit tight for the rest of the night. Well, it's good to see daylight again. Yeah. Let's take a walk over to that clearing in the underbrush. Where we saw it, huh? Okay. And what do you think about it? Well, I don't know. Well, maybe what we saw was just a fluke of nature. It's possible. Yes, it's possible. Yeah, what other explanation can there be? I've got one. But it's so incredible. I... Well, it's happened. I'll tell you later. I want to think about it some more. Well, here we are. Here's here's the clearing. Yeah. We first saw it by those palm trees over there. Look. The tracks of the monster. In the sand. Look how large and deep the tracks are. Yeah. It was a beautiful morning. Until now. Come on. Let's follow him. Okay. Now, they, they go through the brush here and, and towards the beach. Yeah. Yeah, this is... This is the way we saw it go. Oh, the brush is flattened as though a tank had rolled through here. There's sure, no problem following it. Look. This is where it came out on the beach. Yeah, and there's the tracks on the sand leading into the water. It's out there. Somewhere... In the waters of the lagoon. Yeah. Look. Let's unload the raft and then paddle out into the lagoon. What for? Holy smokes. Don't tell me you're going looking for that monster. Well, not exactly, but I got a hunch. And I want to check on it. It's crazy paddling out into that lagoon. How, how do you know it won't attack once we get out there? I don't. It's just a chance we'll have to take. But why? So that I can find the answer to all this. Are you going with me? Okay. I'm going with you. Pete, for an hour I've been paddling you across the lagoon. All you've been doing is peering down into the water. Are they trying to spot the monster? No. Well, if it isn't a monster you're looking for, what then? Stop paddling. 
I think we found it. Found what? Take a look over the side. Into the water. I don't see a thing. Oh, the sun's been in your eyes. Keep looking towards the bottom. Till your eyes get used to the water. Uh, I don't see it. But wait a minute. I can hardly make it out, but... There seems to be a wreck on the bottom. A big one. It is a wreck. That's a battleship you see on the bottom. A battleship? Yeah, don't you understand? This island. It's Bikini. Bikini? You mean... You mean when they dropped an atomic bomb on those old battleships? Yeah. A dozen ships on the bottom here. All sunk by atomic bomb tests. Bikini. Pete, you don't think the island's radioactive, do you? Well, not enough to do us any harm. It's been years since the test. You said you had a crazy explanation for that monster we saw last night. Does that tie in with all this? Yeah. How? Now, look, you'll think I'm nuts, but here goes. We dropped a bomb into this lagoon to see what an underwater explosion would do to those warships. Now, what are you getting at? We know what the atomic bomb did to the ships. But do we know what effect it had on the fish life here in the lagoon? Are you saying that the monster crab we saw last night was the result of the bomb dropped into this lagoon? Well, what other explanation can there be? Remember, Dan, the effect of the bomb on the survivors of Hiroshima left wounds and illnesses that doctors had never seen before. Now, who's to say that the radioactivity in this lagoon couldn't have caused fish life to multiply in size a hundredfold? It can't be. It just can't be. Well, why not? Radioactivity causing a crab to, to, to grow a thousand times bigger? Well, how else can you account for that monster crab we saw last night? I don't know. Well, think about it. Meanwhile, let's paddle back to the beach. Paddled silently across the lagoon to the beach and dragged the raft out of the water. Time and time again, I found myself turning to look out over the waters of the lagoon as Pete's words ran through my mind. His explanation seemed an impossible one, and yet, what other answer could there be? The two of us sat on the beach smoking, watching the moon come up over the lagoon of Bikini. Sure is a beautiful night. Yeah. Do you think they'll send search planes this way, Pete? Well, sooner or later, they'll find us. As long as we have fresh water and fish, we're okay. Yeah, I guess so. Pete! Look at the water the lagoon. Holy smoke. Why, it's been churned up as though there were a dozen whales out there. Could it be whales? Not in these waters. Pete! There's something enormous out, out there threshing around. Well, maybe it'll break through to the surface and we'll be able to see it. Could it be that monster crab we saw last night? Oh, it's something bigger, much bigger. Bigger? Well, that would make whatever it is a couple, couple hundred feet in length. Yeah. The way the water's been churned up, there must be a fight going on out there. Pete, look. They're coming out of the water. The monster crab we saw last night. Another one following there's two others. Dan, some of them are coming this way. Come on, we've got to get out of here. What about our supplies? There's no time to grab them. Get a move on. This way. There were there were dozens of them coming out of the water. Well, they came out of the lagoon. They were fleeing the fight that was going on out there. Whatever it is, it's in the lagoon. I never want to see it. Well, it must be the side of the destroyer. We're going right into it, Pete. I'm getting pushed. I'll right, stop for a minute. Get our bearings, huh? Yeah. Do you hear that? Yeah. Those monster crabs. There must be dozens of them. Overrunning the island. Look. The moon's getting behind the clouds. Oh, no, just our luck. Can't see much now. No, 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 we might run into one in the dark. We're better off staying here. Well, it seems to be heading this way. Can you make out from which direction it's coming? No. The moon is behind the 
must go out. And who's that? It's coming closer. What are you doing with that 45? It's better than nothing. Maybe the sound of shots might frighten it off. It's getting closer all the time. But I... I can't see it. Can you? No. Keep your eyes open. Sounds almost on top of us. Pete! There it is! Pick up! to the peaks for medical supplies. No, 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 don't. No, it's too dangerous. It's no use anyway. No use? I'm dying. No. No, Pete. Oh. Listen to me. No, first... First thing in the morning, if raft is still okay, I shove off. Don't... Don't stay here. Too dangerous. Pete, let me go for the medical supply. No, 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 no. When you're rescued, explain to them. Strange new world. Sea life. Multiplying hundredfold. Radioactivity. Of atomic bomb. And lagoon. Sea life. Will increase. Overrun. Seven seas. Um. Pete. Pete. I sat there beside Pete's body for the rest of the night. Several times I heard monster crabs passing in the brush nearby, but I didn't leave. And the morning island was, once again, peaceful, tranquil. I buried Pete on a high hill and then returned to the beach. The raft was overturned, the supplies gone. I overhauled the raft, gathered coconuts and a supply of water. By noon, I was paddling across the three-mile lagoon of the channel through the reefs that led to sea. As dusk came, I was several miles out to sea. Two nights and days slipped by without my seeing a plane or ship more days. Soon my water was gone. The days that followed were ones of thirst and torture. The will to live left me, and I lost consciousness. The next thing I remember was feeling hands lift me, finding myself here. Where did you say I am? His Majesty ship. Submarine Vadim. Submarine Vadim? Yes. Where, where did you pick me up? Fifty miles southeast of the island of Bikini. Bikini? Bikini. Now you must lie back. Rest. What you need is sleep. Sleep? Sleep, yeah. That's it. Close your eyes. That's it, lad. He's fallen asleep, sir. Yes. Poor devil. Did you catch his ravings about monsters and all that, sir? Yes. Poor chap is clearly out of his mind. Must be, sir. Yet his ravings gives the one the, the chills, they do. It's quite so, quite so. Devil, take it. What happened, sir? Feels as if we've hit a derelict. Carry on, Higgins. Aye, right, aye, sir. What was that? Well, walk you up, did it? Too bad. Well, we may have hit a derelict. It's hard to say. A captain's looking into it. Now, rest easy, lad. Oh, me, what now? Tossed about like a ball. Oh, yes, 
They're trying us down. The nonsense, lad. I just slide back and leave everything. Now hear this. Now hear this. Captain Farnsworth speaking. We're being attacked by some creature of the deep. All crew members to battle stations. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our trip? Oh, what happened to the submarine valiant? Well, after a two-hour battle with an unseen enemy, it managed to escape. But at a naval court of inquiry, Captain Farnsworth was at a loss to explain the nature of the enemy his submarine had been in battle with. Well, of course, there was uh, Lieutenant Dan Walker's testimony, but obviously the poor fellow was out of his head. Who ever heard of monster crabs 20 feet high and denizens of the deep as large as a destroyer? The court could reach no verdict in the matter of the submarine valiant, and there the case rested. Now, if uh, by some chance you should happen to take a voyage across the Pacific, and one night as you stroll on deck, you see a, a giant. Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. have just heard The Mysterious Traveler. Now you can follow other tense and exciting adventures of The Mysterious Traveler in the current issue of The Mysterious Traveler magazine now available. Bill Tonkin speaking. This program came to you from New York. Great story and true. The United States detonated 23 nuclear devices between 1946 and 1958 at seven test sites on the Bikini Islands. These included on the reef, inside the island itself, in the air, and underwater. They had a combined fission yield of 42.2 megatons. That is a whole lot of power. The authors for our story were David A. Kogan and Robert J. Arthur, Jr. These two wrote most, if not all, of the episodes for The Mysterious Traveler. Believe it or not, they met in a radio writing class. The pair would go on to form one of the most fruitful collaborations in old-time radio. It was the perfect partnership. Kogan already had experience writing scripts for radio. He worked on Adventure Into Fear, Nick Carter, Master Detective, The Shadow, and A Voice in the Night. However, Arthur had a very different background. He had an impressive list of published stories in nearly every major pulp magazine of the day. Think weird tales, astounding science fiction, amazing stories, amongst others. Their first project together was a short-lived series called Dark Destiny in 1942. Oh, and for the record, Mysterious Traveler ran from 1943 until 1952. That's nine years and 370 shows total. The bad news? Well, only 75 of those survive today. You can listen to The Mysterious Traveler and many other old-time radio series on archive.org for free. was episode number 440, and it was made possible by Mark Plank, Maddie Ross, Seth Wood, and Daniel Harvey, who all contributed to the show. Thanks, guys. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find an amazing number of links that should fit every need. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it, and please leave reviews and feedback wherever you listen. Pressing follow or like helps us to grow. Thank you for listening, 
and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you.